With the founding of Alexandria, a bright new period of Greek history began. It was the dawn of new leadership and a new way of thinking. When Alexander the Great died, his Egyptian kingdom was taken over by Ptolemy, Alexander's most trusted general, who would build the library Alexander envisioned. Ptolemy I started a dynasty, a series of kings from the same family, who would rule Egypt for almost 300 years. Ptolemy I made Alexandria the capital of Egypt, but still, the city faced powerful competition from ruler generals of other countries. They competed with one another in power, in wealth, and grandeur. One field of competition was culture. And Ptolemy wanted his city not to be only a capital of a powerful country, but a center of enlightenment, of knowledge, and of learning. The original Alexandrian citizens were local Egyptians, the Macedonian guard, a large Jewish community, and streams of Greek immigrants. Thanks to Ptolemy, Alexandria immediately began to attract influential scholars from around the Greek world. Ptolemy I was a man of iron will and intelligence. He surrounded himself with a circle of important men, advanced in the fields of literature, philosophy, and science. The architect Demetrius of Phaleron helped Ptolemy lay plans for the new center. Bricks, broken temples, and battered sphinxes lay atop the only surviving portion of the ancient institution. The Serapeum, or Daughter Library, is thought to have been built inland from the main library and museum. But where was the main part of the structure located? The Library of Alexandria now offers more questions than it does answers. One of the great mysteries of the Library of Alexandria is where was it? Uh, nobody's sure where it was. Uh, we think it was by the water. Uh, and that's a good bet for where it is now, under the water. Uh, we also don't know what it looked like. There are no contemporary accounts that really give a description of what the library was like. So we really wonder, what did the thing look like? Did it have two stories? Did it have three stories? Was it dark? Was it well lit? Uh, there are a lot of things we don't know about the library. The main library was probably built close to the harbor in the royal Greek section of Alexandria. It was thought to be in or near the palace called the Bruchion, or museum. Its research was royally funded. Many local scholars were on the king's payroll. The Ptolemies were understandably proud of their library. There was a strong sense of obligation on the part of the Ptolemies to foster learning, which is quite remarkable in a way. It, it always is. Uh, when their real concerns were with power, security of the dynasty and the problems of Egypt, which are immense. One of the things Ptolemy did was collect books, a very Greek thing to do, collect as many books as possible. And he did it with a vengeance. Visitors arrived with their versions of famous older literary texts. Sometimes agents were sent abroad to bring back new works. On occasion, manuscripts were donated. Even Aristotle's library was willed to the Library of Alexandria. We are told also that there was a law that any traveler who set sail into, this, and into the harbor of Alexandria was searched for books. Not for drugs, but for books. And if a book was found, it was taken to the library. If there was no copy of it, it was confiscated, and the traveler was compensated. So they did wonderful things in order to uh, acquire books. But the normal method of acquiring books was, of course, by purchasing them. And uh, there were marts and markets for books. So in this way, Alexandria acquired 
the largest collection of books ever existed in antiquity. How many scrolls were eventually contained within the libraries at Alexandria? Ptolemy's goal was to have every existing written work in the Greek world and beyond. The secondary collection, located in the Serapeum alone, was said to hold 300,000 books. But over the course of history, the collection grew even larger. We don't know how many books there were. The best authority I know of says about 400, 500,000, which is an awfully big library by anybody's standards. But counting books is a very inexact science. Countless ancient manuscripts were not just stored away at the Alexandria Library. They were used as research and reference for other newer scholars. And priceless books were copied by local scribes and traded for books from other parts of the ancient world. Some of the most significant work in history could have been lost forever were it not for scrolls copied in Alexandria. The main significance of the library and, and the museum at Alexandria is that it did what a great library does. It disseminates knowledge. When you go in and take a book out of the library, you're performing one of the great basic cultural functions, and the library is doing its job. Each piece had to be cataloged, perhaps cross-referenced, and put away. Librarians had to be able to retrieve the works easily, and scores of new works were coming in all the time. Along with more material for the library came more visitors. Scholars were drawn to Alexandria, which in turn enhanced its reputation as a cutting-edge center for learning and knowledge. Herophilus, the anatomist, established an in-house medical school at the Bruchion. Before Alexandria, doctors used animals to research human anatomy. Long before anesthetized operations were performed, it was rumored that scientists in Alexandria operated directly on living men. No evidence for this charge exists, but Herophilus was among the first to perform medical examinations on humans after their death. The Greeks were prohibited from doing dissection by tradition. It was prohibited to cut the human body. It was almost a sacrilege for the Greeks. But on Egyptian soil, you had the tradition of the Egyptian embalmers, who for 3,000 years had been dissecting bodies. So at the medical school in Alexandria, for the first time, physicians could practice on human cadavers. And in Greece, in Athens, for example, there were physicians who often said, I wish I had studied at Alexandria because they could do human dissection. So the library in Alexandria was, in a sense, more free than any other place, especially the medical school, and this was an important feature of it. Besides literature and medicine, the Alexandrian research under the Ptolemies favored mathematics. The founder of geometry lived in Alexandria. Euclid published a textbook that replaced all previous efforts, and he also opened a school. The geometry you studied in grade school is, of course, from the Alexandria Library, Euclid, who codified the results of the basic theorems that others had made. And you will still see in an ordinary, everyday paperback, Introduction to Geometry, the name of one of the men who worked and studied at the library. Little is known personally about Euclid, but one legend remains. When Euclid showed his new work to King Ptolemy, the king asked if there was an easier way to do geometry. Euclid was said to reply, there is no royal road. Ptolemy worked tirelessly to build the library, but as he grew older, he looked to his son to govern the land of the pharaohs. And when Ptolemy died in 283 BC, Ptolemy II became the sole ruler of Egypt. The great Ptolemaic dynasty would continue almost 300 years until Cleopatra's death. How would the Ptolemies leave their mark 
on the library of Alexandria.